Shall I start? Yes, Zubia. Namaste and greetings. I, Zubia Moin, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all at IMPRI, hashtag Web Policy Talk. Today, we are gathered for a special talk on the topic, a pragmatic approach to gender responsive budgeting, Experience of Kerala by Dr. Mridul Epen. This deliberation is a part of the State of Gender Equality, hashtag Gender Gaps series, which is organized by the IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center. As the chair for the session, we have Professor Vibhuti Patel, visiting distinguished professor at IMPRI and GISC, former professor, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. We welcome you, ma'am. With permission of chair, I would like to introduce the gathering. Please go ahead, Subia, introduce the panelists. And Thank you, ma'am. We are elated to welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. Mridul Epen. Professor Mridul Epen is a former board of the Kerala State Planning Board. On, she's also an honorary fellow, Center for Development Studies, Trivandrum. We, are, we welcome you, ma'am. We are also joined by esteemed discussants. First, we'd like to welcome Professor Mini Sukumar, member, Kerala State Planning Board. We welcome you, ma'am. Professor Suchita Krishna Pasad, former head of economics department, Elphinstone College, Dr. Homi Baba State University, Mumbai. We'd also welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Sang Mitra Dhar, technical coordinator, states, gender responsive budgeting, UN women, uh, welcome, ma'am. Professor Ishita Mukhopadhyay, Professor, Department of Economics and former Director, Women's Studies Research Center, University of Calcutta. A very warm welcome to all of you. Now, I invite our chair, Professor Vibhuti Patel, to initiate the deliberation with her opening remarks, invite our esteemed speaker and to proceed further. We look forward to learning from the esteemed gathering. Thank you. Today's esteemed speaker, Dr. Amritu Lipman, and the discussants, uh, Professor Ishita Mukhopadhyay, Professor Minik Sukumar, Dr. Sangamitra Dar, and Dr. Suchita Krishna Prasad. Uh, good evening. And I would first of all like to express my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Arjun Kumar and Zubia for providing this platform for this special uh, talk on pragmatic response to gender responsive budgeting experiences of Kerala. Now, concept of GRB, gender responsive budgeting, ga gained widespread popularity during the late, later part of 1980s when women's movement and gender economists started uh, pressurizing the nation states to translate gender commitments into budgetary commitments so that the funds, functions, and functionaries could be assigned for programs and schemes to reduce gender gaps in crucial areas of health, education, employment, skill building, decision making, and to combat gender-based violence. Currently, 84 countries have adopted the, some variant of gender budgeting, and the UN Women has played a pivotal role in capacity building of the state and non-state actors in GRB processes at national and subnational level. Women Empowerment Policy 2001 had recommended gender audit of budgets. GRB got official stamp in 2005 with uh, 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 with a government ruling GR uh, from the Ministry of Finance that was sent to all states and union territories aimed at empowerment of women through higher and more gender focused government expenditure. This initiated process of subnational level gender responsive budgeting. Uh, though the Ministry of Women and Child Development formed in uh, through the Ministry of Women and Child Development, which was formed in 2006, became the nodal agency to implement GRB in India. It is the Ministry of Finance uh, that in coordination with NIPFP that carried out the official study on GRB to design matrices of gender budgeting. While Center for Budget and Governance not only provides in-depth analysis of budget from gender lens, but also shows the pathways to projecting best practices and demand different sectors of economy facing intersectional vulnerabilities and marginalization. Kerala has been at the forefront of GRB right from 9th five-year plan 
1997, the WCP uh, was uh, institutionalized and 10% of the state budget started get, uh, was allocated for gender concerns. Kerala was the first state to ensure active decision makers in the planning board of the government of Kerala were the first to establish gender park in 2013 to work towards gender equality and empowerment of the state. So Professor Mirthul Ippin, as a member of Kerala State Planning Board during 2016 to 2021, spearheaded all efforts of GRB processes with commitment for intersectional gender justice and directing development interventions beyond gender binaries. Now I request Dr. Mridhu Lippan to make her presentation on a pragmatic response to gender responsive budgeting experiences of Kerala. Over to Dr. Mridhu Lippan. Thank you so much, uh, Dibhuti. Uh, I must thank Impri for inviting me for this talk. I can see people who have heard this before, so I'm sorry for them, but I hope there are some who have not heard much about gender responsive budgeting and uh, I'm addressing them. And it's interesting to, uh, to you know, for me that Impri, even without knowing who all are involved and what you all are doing, I was just getting emails from them about the web talks they were having and I was attending some of them, you know. And I found them very interesting. And I really wish, uh, Impri, uh, that then only later I found Vibhuti, you are there, and others whom I know are there. And uh, I'm very happy that you all are, you've taken on this uh, task. And it's really very enlightening and good for us to have good speakers speaking on, uh, you know, on different areas. I heard the one on urban development, I remember. And I heard two, three others. Whenever I could, I have been attending them. So all the best to Impri, and I'm very thankful that you have invited me today for this talk. Now, <clears throat> uh, what do, uh, do I mean by the pragmatic approach to gender responsive budgeting? Um, the second the slide, uh, Arjun, the next slide. Uh, Kerala has been attempting uh, mainstreaming. Uh, just a second, I don't know how to minimize all of you all so that we, I can see the full um, small active, okay. Even supposing I don't want to see you, then what do I do? Uh, Remove the speaker option, ma'am. Speaker option. You so minimize it to just speaker, and then you'll see the screen. This one? So this Chota one? Where is that right, one? Is it right top? Me, aapko dikh rahe view. View. In that, ah. Yeah. In that, okay. you change it to speaker, and then you'll get the screen on your. Uh, uh, exit full screen? No. Swap video and shared screen, side by side gallery, side by side speaker. This one? Yes, yes, yes. I press on that, is it? Yes. Okay. So I get the full, uh, now I get you, Sang Sangamitra, so it's okay. <laughs> on, a, <laughs> on the side, it's okay. So it was coming on the presentation, so I was a little. So uh, we have been trying to mainstream gender through gender budgeting as an integral part of the process since the 11th plan. Earlier, as Vibhuti pointed out, actually, we what we call gender aware planning because we had the WCP, a very conscious attempt was made in the ninth plan at the local level to uh, integrate gender into the planning process, the local planning process. And uh, there was a 10% mandated out of the funds which devolved from the state, not state funds, but the, stars, the funds which devolved from the state government to the local bodies, 10% was supposed to be kept for women specific schemes and the other schemes were supposed to undergo a gender lens. So the mainstreaming didn't happen, but the WCP continues. And only now I hear that local bodies are actually engaging in gender budgeting. 20 or 30 of them have done it, but I have not seen the document as yet. So from WCP, they're also uh, you know, migrating to a gender responsive budgeting type of situation. Uh, now, I'm not going into the details of what is gender budgeting, why gender budgeting and how, because I think most of you are familiar with it. But in very brief, I have to say that gender responsive budgeting recognizes the significance of women's unpaid household and care work, which tends to be neglected in macro development policy. Because what is the assumption about the household? The typical assumption that it is a male breadwinner and the woman homemaker. And another very uh, damaging uh, assumption, I should say implicit assumption is, that women's time in household work is infinitely elastic, enabling them to balance work and home while adjusting to any adverse impact of changes in macroeconomic policy to keep the household running. And therefore, 
gender responsive budgeting foregrounds the need for public investment in these activities to enable women to participate equally in the development process. And that's the whole idea, that women and men should be equally on a level footing, be able to participate. And I think the pandemic has sharply brought out how women are forced into their role as shock absorbers across the world. There have been enough studies to show us that. Next one, uh, Arjun. Uh, now, uh, with the, you know, and this with the persistent, what, why did this happen? Because there was a persistent mismatch between government policy and development outcomes. So feminist scrutiny actually focused on macroeconomic development policy and the urgent need to make it gender sensitive for bringing about a transformation of women's position. Socially and cons uh, constructed gender roles leave women with little power economically, socially, and politically. The flip side of which is meant socio-biological drive for mastery. I mean, you're the head of the household, therefore everybody's under your control and you know you, you can even be violent. So this sort of manifested increasingly as violence against women. Now gender mainstreaming, uh, as you all know, was formally established as a major global strategy for the promotion of gender equality at the fourth UN World Conference in Beijing in 1995, cited in the Beijing Platform for Action. And it was in 1996 actually that Kerala introduced gender aware planning in, at the local level in uh, the ninth five-year plan. The next one. So it's an entry point into macroeconomic policy. I mean, let me say that we, gender, we are doing gender mainstreaming through gender budgeting as an entry point on, uh, as an entry point to macroeconomic development policy to make it more gender sensitive. Now, what was Kerala's experience? From our own experience in every year of the 11th plan, as also of gender budgeting ex exercises done by other states, the main, there were two main limitations we found. One was that even to achieve the technical objective of estimating the flow of budgetary resources to women, it was difficult to do it because of the non-availability of gender disaggregated data, making it difficult to separate allocations flowing to women from composite schemes, which, have in, uh, which impact both men and women, especially in the infrastructure sectors. Second limitation was more importantly, the absence of a broader vision of including women in the development planning process so that gender needs can be integrated into the process across set sectors right from the beginning. This would make the exercise more meaningful and move beyond getting bogged down in a number of in a number crunching game of guess estimating the financial flow of resources to women. So this became clear as we tried to do gender responsive budgeting using its own methodology. Now, next one, please. So as we know, the, the focus of most gender budgeting work has been on the expenditure side of the gender budgeting, classifying resources flowing to women into part A and part B, the two together giving us the total. However, as I said earlier, it was difficult to segregate men and women's resources in composite schemes. Also, we could do this only for gender related sectors where we knew very much that women are there and perhaps had some macro data on the numbers of women involved in agriculture, or in dairy farm, or in uh, uh, in, in fishing, in uh, education, health, where we had some data available, we could do this exercise for gender-related sectors, like as, as I said, like women and child development, social welfare, traditional industries, etc. But which constitute not more than 35 to 40 percent of plan expenditures, if you look up your budget. But almost 60 to 65 percent of plan outlays were in the so-called gender-unrelated sectors largely infrastructure, which remained outside the purview of the gender budgeting exercise, public works, housing, water supply and sanitation, forests, irrigation, power, ports and transport, for which it was difficult to disaggregate the beneficiaries data. So next one, please. So that was the methodological challenge. How do we disaggregate the data of in composite schemes? Now, so clearly one had to move beyond numbers and a focus on the chapter on women and child development to looking at women as growth agents in the state's political economy across all sectors, which meant engaging with visibilizing women in each sector, recognizing their contribution as consumer producer or worker, emphasizing the need to consider their needs, interests in the overall determination of sectoral and de macro development policy, and the extent to which allocations can be shifted towards social and economic investment and provision of public goods beneficial for women. There is enough evidence to establish that we know that there is women are there in almost all sectors, but that they have not been, their problems and their growth achievements have not been adequately addressed in the planning process. In short, 
gender has to become an integral part of development planning, keeping in mind the fact that it is also a political process because you have to shift resources from some sectors to some other sectors. In Kerala, the attempt was to address these lacunae, the non-availability of gender disaggregated data and some sort of a perspective on women and their priorities in the state's economy. These, we, we attempted to at address these local lacunae through a more doable and pragmatic approach. We tried to see how much we could do with whatever we have in a pragmatic way. So we did that in the 11th plan when we did the gender responsive budgeting. In the 11th plan, we did not produce any document. We used to just send the data, which would approximately be part A and part B and send it to the finance department, which then uh, took it in there. The finance minister would quote some figures from these tables in his budget speech. But the 13th plan, we actually became a little, you know, uh, we, we strengthened the methodology a little bit more and we could actually produce a document for all the five years of the uh, 13th plan, and this is continuing. And this is one thing I think which I have to emphasize that it has become sustainable. It is a sustainable exercise in, in Kerala now. For that the reason, I, I'll come to it later, but it is continuing and it will continue for the rest of the years also. So now let me just quickly uh, take, uh, uh, give you all a, a feel of what was this, what was this pragmatic approach? What was the necessary steps in this pragmatic approach? The first, uh, what were the ingredients? The first was, of course, a strong government commitment. I think now more states have been able to manage that. The finance minister or the governor or the chief minister announces the gender budgeting is part of their, uh, part of the agenda as far as budgeting goes. So this probably is now uh, not uh, relevant to most of the states because they have achieved this. Second is need to identify thrust areas of women's development. This is very important because it guides us in the process of formulating schemes and integrating gender into the plan process. So when we are making employment schemes, we also are aware that we want to generate or we want to create employment for women. We have that as a trust area. So then we will try to push in the employment scheme for women and of men or men and women together into every sector that is that we have we think it is possible. So we have to identify areas of women's trust areas of women's development which will guide the process of formulating schemes and integrating gender into the plan process. Public expenditure would have to be directed to such schemes, some exclusively for women, while composite schemes which benefit both men and women have to be made more responsive to gender concerns. That is, what is the prag pragmatism in that? To focus on programs rather than finances and to then ensure to the extent possible that funds are made available for these schemes. So let's first think of what we want to do for women. And then we start thinking of how to get the funds for that. Third is creating awareness on the significance of gender across departments, even those which are apparently gender related, because most of the time when the format goes to them, they say, but we have no schemes on gender. It doesn't relate to us. So what did we do in the 11th plan? What was the pragmatic approach we took? For instance, in the 11th plan, we initially restricted ourselves to primarily women's issues, which would not be taken up in any other department. It would be taken up by the women and child. It was called social welfare at that time. So gender-based violence, empowerment of women, occupational health, all these figured in the chapter on gender. Next one, please. However, in the next two years, in the, and as, we, as I said, women are there in all the sectors. And in the next two years, in the post-2008 recession period, when government was spending large amounts of resources on infrastructure to revive the economy, we forayed into the infrastructure sector with 100% women schemes, which would visibilize women in so many more sectors and be easily identified. So even transport, if it says, but how do we separate how many women are traveling by bus and how many men are traveling by bus? We say, no, you think of how, what scheme in your department would benefit women. So they said, yes, we should have good toilets and restrooms at all major bus depots, you see? So this was 100% if you take it for women in the infrastructure sectors, at least as a beginning, it is a, a, a major pragmatic approach to sensitizing officials and policymakers to gender by focusing on 100% women schemes. So we had, you know, we know that women too need infrastructure. So we evolved a scheme on gender friendly infrastructure prepared largely by the departments themselves which was preceded by a one day capacity building workshop for officials. The, the morning was for some academic or some theories on what is gender in a, in a simple way. They were told about gender, what is gender, 
what is gender sensitization? What do we mean by sensitizing macro development policy? Afternoon, we gave them a checklist which was prepared by the Ministry of Women and Child Development of Government of India at that time, at the time of the 11th plan, I think they prepared it. And we said, you make proposals looking at this. We, we modified the checklist a little bit, made it simpler. You look at the checklist and make proposals for your own department. So this was a very helpful exercise. Make them do it themselves in the first workshop. So this was one way what I call the pragmatic approach to sensitizing officials and having some schemes also in the infrastructure sectors so that from five or six sectors which had gender schemes in 2009-10, we had about 12 or 13 sectors in which we had gender sensitive, sensitive schemes in 2010-11. So uh, next one, please. Now, I am just giving you what I thought was, I'll give you some examples of what I mean by part A, what are the schemes? How did we do part A and part B? Now I'm taking more of the current ones. What we did in the 11th plan, I'm not taking that much, but some of the schemes were there earlier. Some of them have come new. Some of them have got new components. Now, this is the way, for instance, you can, an infrastructure sector, police or housing, how do you make it gender sensitive? So this is what we did. There's a pink patrol, gender awareness and gender friendly infrastructure construction of new women police stations and police uh, women cells, basic amenities, public works, the PWD, how can we make them gender sensitive? So I'm just picking up a few, you know, there are, there are many more schemes, basic amenities, toilets in district taluk village headquarters. So this is what we did. Then housing, housing is working women's hostels, the housing board wanted to do that. Then upgradation of women's material production unit in what is called Nirmati Kendra. There's another agency here, they, were, they have a women's uh, concrete brick making unit. So upgradation of that. So that becomes a scheme for women and that has been put under housing. Now, if you look at the social infrastructure, medical and public health, setting up maternity units, speciality healthcare unit for transgender persons. There's a new scheme this year. It was there earlier, but I think that much more focus has been given this time. Uh, medical care for victims of violence. That is, we call it Bhumika. We took the uh, example of Dilasa at that time. Bhumika came up in 2009. So Dilasa people were called to Kerala and they guided us in setting up Bhumika. And the homeo department, when they saw Bhumika, they said homeopathic department can start something. So they started Sitalayam, giving homeo medicines and counseling and all that. So homeopathy had Sitalayam. Then in labor and welfare, I'm just picking up an interesting scheme, protein rich noon meals in women ITIs. We visited an ITI in Trivandrum and I found that it was much under capacity, you know, the girls, there were not as many girls as warranted by the capacity of that. So we just said, you know, girls have this problem, you know, getting up early in the morning, coming out, and if they are married, then what about their food and everything? So we said, you just try this one little scheme, give them, you say that noon meal is free for you in the team. And you believe it or not, it has really done wonders, you know, this noon meal for women in ITIs, it has really done wonders. It grew from a very small number to about four crores now. All women ITIs are covered. So that is one. The second one, and I'm calling part A 90 to 900%. I'll just tell you why. Uh, no, go to the next one. Because Narega in Kerala, 90% are women. Unlike the mandated 33% and other states, I think 50 to 60% are women. Here, 90, above 90% 90 of women. I didn't want to leave them out of gender budgeting part A. That's a very important component for us. So we have modified part A to 90 to 100. So Narega, then we have Kudumbushri, which is a uh, specifically women's program where we put a lot of money for livelihood promotion. So Kudumbushri is there. So art and culture, this is now, we are emphasizing a lot on art, culture, and sports, which we think are very good ways of flexing minds and you know, making people more gender sensitive through these activities, rather than probably being given, uh, you know, uh, sort of lectures on uh, gender sensitization. These are things, cultural initiatives, which can have a, probably a, a, a higher impact, we feel, because culture is so important to women that we found that. And so Samam is a new cultural initiative for gender equality. Then Kerala Chalachitra Academy, there's one Chalachitra Academy, they want to train women in technical field of cinema. You know, the women are anyway very not found much in the cinema field, but there's so much scope in the technical areas. Also. Even if you're not directors, you can work in the technical area of cinema. So there's a scheme like that 
then there is a kerala sports council football and volleyball academy something different challenging gender stereotypes sports infra facilities in special zones for women another scheme so i'm saying if you know what you want to do you can definitely think of a scheme and try to put it in the plan that's what i'm trying to show you labor and labor welfare another very interesting scheme was studio apartment for working women in urban areas so women travel travel lots of jobs are coming up in urban areas women want to have small apartments for themselves or rental so studio apartments for women that is also taken off i think last year it has taken off so two crores for that then in women and child development i had to include this it's a women and child development scheme we have been struggling to get eggs and milk to be you know agreed upon of being served in anganwadis this year the planning board succeeded and the department also succeeded and eggs and milk will be given i think thrice in a week to anganwadi children so that was a big achievement 61 crores for that then ashwas kiranam is another innovative scheme in scheme in in in, in the plan where, where women who are largely the caregivers for physically and intellectually disabled children or or, or elders they are given a certain social assistance a small amount but just to recognize that care uh economy like their, their care giving role uh next one uh but we know that these are 100% women scheme but the larger resources flow to composite schemes which benefit both men and women so what was the we felt the need to develop a pragmatic method for separating the allocations that was the and strengthen the methodology of part b estimates further so one mechanism which helped us in this process was that while macro level data may not be available by gender scheme wise gender disaggregate data are indeed available with departments so they have the we have the, they have the data so you know keep on pestering them to give us that data telephoning them bringing them up you know we want this data immediately but the, they they of course are also uh, you know there's a problem for them because there's such massive data and i'll come later to uh, you know what we should be doing helping them to actually to how to Uh, systematize this data collection which they have so through a well established and how did we the pragmatic approach was how was it done we have a well established planning process the annual plan discussions so while impressing upon departments the importance of 100% women schemes the need to specify share of women for composite schemes or the share expected to flow to women based on their own experience or based on gender disaggregated beneficiary data which they have was also stressed next one so uh, departments were encouraged persuaded to break up total scheme outlays into components highlighting those directed at girls or women or have a woman component in terms of a specific percentage or make available to us gender disaggregated data on beneficiaries in some cases perhaps of the previous year which could then be used to separate out the flow of resources to men and women fifth we it was very necessary to provide explanatory notes at the end of part b why should why have we done this why have we taken 30% or why have we taken 40% we have to explain it so i know that the methodology is not anywhere perfect but to me it's a some sort some sort of a pragmatic practical way of whatever we have try to see whether we can get some robust estimates of what is flowing to women next one now six what were our thus area skill development employment generation livelihood security given the low wprs in the state creating an enabling environment for women to work through provision of basic amenities we have to look at women in that broader uh, uh, ecosystem you know they have children they have household work so creating an enabling and they have to be safe and secure while traveling and at workplaces and prevention the third was prevention of gender based violence so these were the broad things we had in mind so when we were doing planning we kept these in mind to make the schemes and the thrust areas are also modified if necessary given extreme events in particular years or emerging areas of gender concern the whole state machinery planning board and the department gets into action to reprioritize schemes in the in the flood time more had to be given to the local bodies to to give livelihood support to the uh, to the women so more funds were directed towards that some of the funds were uh, reduced from the other departments so you can also modify the the priority areas given the the situation so i i not go to detail i think it's understood so uh, the next one uh next one we are going ha huh. the flood for instance we had to reprioritize next one 
next slide uh, arjun ha huh. so this year's dv schemes has schemes on covid affected sectors and people so we know we have we have that and uh, uh, health sector and generating employment more funds on socio cultural schemes that for greater safety security of women so there are they have added more emphasis to education and employment because kerala is uh, you know uh, is charting out the route to a knowledge economy so education skilling is very important how do we access that from the total plan outlays of the government of kerala and because of the stage thrust on a knowledge economy so more emphasis has been given on higher education and skilling in this particular budget on women safety again because we've had violence during covid so more funds have also been given to the uh, to create a gender awareness in different ways and that's another interesting thing that you keep thinking on different different schemes if one doesn't work think of another one what can we do to make things better so that is what we have been doing the total uh, budget also includes schemes for students returning from ukraine we have lots of students who have come back from ukraine but i don't have the number of girls and how much is going to girls but the budget uh, the state budget carries an allocation for that hence by the 13th plan you are able to develop a doable framework uh with outlays allocated for 90 to 100% women specific schemes included in part a of our gender budget and schemes in which women share is specified so with increasing sensitization this will you know now the departments themselves have become you know keen on what what can we do for women so that sort of environment has been generated next one and the process of learning over the year that's very important because i i find in this year's budget for instance uh, we can strengthen the gender budgeting in, in so many ways an interesting improvement in this year's gender budget is providing scheme wise allocation for transgender community rather than just the total allocation we used to give five crores is kept for transgender this time they have actually given it scheme wise so this is an improvement and both in part a and b a brief picture of the scheme is written up in this uh, particular budget 22 23 budget under the new member mini they have given also a write up on the you know remarks on the site what is the uh, the the project about what is the scheme about so including gender into budget has to go beyond numbers to engage with visibilizing women in each sector recognizing their contribution emphasizing the need to consider their needs and interests in the overall determination of macro development policy and the extent to which allocations can be shifted quickly we'll just go through the part b so that you understand uh, how we did the part b uh, thing i have not given all the details uh, next one um, arjun see developing in the health for instance developing phcs as family health centers that's one scheme there's there's a wonderful scheme that has happened that the primary health centers are now much added activities and they call family health centers we took the uh, inf information from them and they gave us the information 50% they said it's not that they are making it an easy number no they looked up their documents and told us 50% similarly comprehensive mental health program both men and women are there so you have to ask the department to give you a split up they gave that then from the nhm nrhm flexi pool the components are there we take the reproductive sector health component and we get the number this is only the state plan okay we are not including the central plan in this education we have a scheme on free supply of uniforms it is 50 50 because there are 49.75% are girls up to class 8 so we put 50% it at school educational technology which came in so handy during the pandemic support for students in international collaborative degree programs okay under higher education money is kept there and girls are given 68% of that teaching learning and skill gap reduction in the in the new situation of wanting to create a kerala knowledge economy a lot of emphasis has been given there urban development waste management and we have now i cannot say we are the only state because orissa has come out with an uh, with an urban employment guarantee scheme which is much larger than ours ours is 125 crores now just like the narega we have this ayankali urban employment guarantee scheme in health insurance scheme for migrant workers we have avas 1.5 crores We, uh, and we have because of the pandemic lots of non resident kerlites have come back so there's a big scheme for them quickly i'll go through that uh, i think there's one more table on part b uh, arjun because i'm running out of time responsible tourism in tourism training and capacity there the components are given you know empowerment of women and marginal communities through tourism because we know that tourism lots of women are involved in growing things in responsible tourism the hotels are supposed to 
to uh, to buy things from these self help groups of women with more na largely kudubishri women so we can get from the components what are the things going to women and we can put that as the allocation to women transport is another interesting one one i gave you was where it was 100% that is the toilets now they have e mobility autos e autos and we make sure that 50% of those autos will go to women so there's a composite scheme which has been split then kerala maritime board they have training programs for their engineers and officials so we told them give us the women are, are they women in your uh, they said yes okay give us the numbers of women and we could take that small amounts but you know it shows that they are all getting conscious of this art and culture one of the you know the most uh, dream projects has been this ksfdc facilitating two feature films by women directors and now two by scst directors so that's an uh, addition this year and two more films by them so uh, then of course cultural and, and uh, upliftment of women and transgender persons are other schemes of which we take the proportions uh, uh, then uh, seventh i'm coming to the quickly to the um, the most critical approach in sustaining the grb effort is the existence of an institutional mechanism the planning board which coordinates all departmental plans including the gender schemes and programs the advantage that kerala has and which facilitates the integration of gender into budgeting is that it is followed concurrently by the departments and the planning board even reprioritization of schemes is helped by the fact that each department's activities can be scrutinized in one place such a mechanism is crucial to facilitate the grb and together with the continued government support is perhaps our biggest advantage then i've given a summary statement of how actually allocations have been going up right from the 2016 2017 18 up to 22 23 each year we have been able to encourage more departments to to enter the gender budgeting fold and our proportions have increased so quickly what has been next one what has been the outcome one definitely we have had an increase in workforce participation you know that is we we were one of the laggards we are still very low we are, as you know indian workforce part women workforce participation are very low we all know that but kerala was even lower and we have managed to to surpass the all india average but of course there are other states above us but we are now higher than the all india average and this is because in each of these periods of crisis a lot of focus was given to livelihood support for women so in the first package of uh, the uh, uh, pandemic 2000 crores in the first package of the floods 2000 crores was for kudumbushi for self help groups for ayankali urban employment for narega narega shot up in those two or three years so we find that our and it has happened in rural areas and among the self employed so and of course to some extent wage labor also because narega has gone now another major outcome is challenging stereotypes so we have these two films by the uh, film development corporation being made by women one of them entered the international film festival which was held here recently i think she got an award for best uh, 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 debut director i think that was the award she got then our crime records data show a decline in all forms of violence against women from 2016 to 2020 now i know all the feminists will say that is all rubbish their people don't report to the uh, uh, report uh, to report to the police stations i agree i agree but when we believe serb data when the crimes are rising we have to believe the data when the crimes are falling but the pandemic has pushed us back to this that is definitely there that pandemic has brought in violence uh, and in fact even after the uh, unlock the levels are to some extent higher than what they were before the pandemic but during 27 16 to 20 there was actually a decline in the numbers in all forms of violence against women so um, uh, next one the biggest challenge now ahead of us is the gender audit monitoring and evaluation i think that's the biggest challenge that we face now and we have to do uh it is also necessary to do a detailed ex post budget analysis after all you have made the budget on 22 23 you have to look at how much are we adding in each sector how much money is going in each sector what are the gaps still remain next one second is to continuously improve plan write up this is very important for all the states when the, the plans are written up this specific allocation to women has to be specified in the plan write up and which is if you look at the, our annual plan proposals or you look at the economic review of kerala you will find that in places it is written there of which certain such an amount will go to women of which 30% will go to women it's written there it has to be written in black and white now 
And departmental data, there's another big challenge to have to be maintained much more systematically. What is crucial here is to help departments to manage, organize large data generated under the schemes, which needs to be disaggregated by gender and be made accessible. More and more departments have to be brought within the ambit of gender budget. That's what the attempt of the planning board will be as many, because there's still so many schemes which have a gender component we know, but we are not able to untangle it. Now, quickly, th this is uh, just by way of conclusion. Uh, I, of course, the, the, there should be some capacity building program at least once in a year. Then uh, all the policies should, to, should be uh, go, gone through a gender lens, whether it's industrial, agricultural, IT, anything. Last but not least is funding. Some areas are clearly lacking funds and we have to put more and more funds into those. So uh, let me conclude by saying, uh, the next one, um, Arjun, the, the price, price process described above is for the gender budget at the state level. As I said, there's a gender budget at the local level also, because that is 10% going plus whatever they get in the other uh, sectors that will be. So that is now being, uh, being uh, uh, honed and being improved. And this, what I presented to you was only the state budget, agenda budget. Uh, so gender budget at the local level should go beyond the 10%. The 10% is the mandate, but they should foray into other areas and that should be added to the gender budget. In conclusion, despite its limitation, it is useful because it sensitizes government society to the fact that budgets impact differentially on men and women, but by doing so create a consciousness that women's needs have to be built into the project formulation, which should get reflected in the scheme plan write-ups. And last, of course, it's a political exercise. We all know because shifting anything from one to the other, there will always be the underlying gender relations are unequal. We know that. And so it's not very easy to get funds for, for last one. The last one, there's another slide. It's a political economy question. It should not be lost sight of. So while on the one hand, it's, a, it's a finding a fit between the technical project of mainstreaming gender equality in policy programs and projects, the political project of challenging inequality and promoting women's rights. I think you were showing it in your chart, Vibhuti. We have to keep fighting for that. You know, that is not over. But we are using this as a means of achieving that. Hence, the struggle for gender equality will continue. But that unequal gender relations can change and gender stereotypes are being challenged cannot be denied. We saw what happened in COVID, which were the best countries who performed, the countries which were men or which were womaned by women. So we had the COVID-19 has come out strikingly and we have challenged the androcentric views on leadership and governance. So social relations can change. That's what we are trying to do through gender budget. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mirda Lipman for very, very comprehensive uh, uh, and exhaustive presentation, delineating processes of gender responsive budgeting in Kerala, explaining concepts, po policies, programs, way forward challenges and connecting micro, meso and macroeconomy and also uh, emphasizing the role of uh, political struggles uh, in ch challenging the gender norms and also the political economy issues. Now I would like to ask Professor Ishita Mukhopadhyay that as gender economists, what is your response to Dr. Pradilipan's presentation? Over to Dr. Ishita Mukhopadhyay. Uh, thank you, Bridul, for uh, laying down the Kerala budget experience and also making some general comments on the take from a gender responsive budgeting. So I would rather comment on the take for India as a whole and for from the Kerala uh, model. I would specifically mention something which is in uh, middle slides and middle talked about it, that the role of an institution to carry forward this gender responsive budgeting. And this is a plan, the five-year plan and planning board and planning institutions. So I think the take for India, this is very crucial, that the plan mechanism, how is the plan mechanism related to the gender responsive budgeting and how the, the institutions are so crucial. So as you can see that in India, we have moved out of plans. So the scope of gender responsive budgeting, if the take from Kerala is taken up, 
then the scope for gender uh, responsive budgeting is to be found in a, in a in a different institution but no different institution other than planning exists so uh, what is to be done in current in india with the dissolution of the gender planning apparatus so this is a crucial question of taking the take away the second i think i would just uh, lift from ridu's presentations a few points second is the public investment part and the part of looking it up as a macro policy this macro policy aspect of gender responsive budgeting is often missed out when we talk about grbs even in the international scale when we talk about grbs it's macro policies and the appropriate macro indicators to indicate the direction of the fiscal expenditure budgets to direction of these this is very crucial the to look into or to get the signals out of the appropriate macro indicators so macro policy is a essential part of it which is mostly missed out when we discuss gender responsive budgeting gender responsive budgeting is different to gender budgeting definitely and we will explain this very clearly that it is an indicator to building up to a much greater project of uh, inclusiveness of gender and visibility of women in all spheres now uh, although this started the whole discussion started with the beijing platform i would also refer to 2015 addis ababa conven uh, convention of transformative finance for gender mainstreaming and the take from this transformative finance transformative finance in gender responsive budgeting will be uh, <coughs> or rather has been a good indicator of uh, these i completely agree with mridul when mridul is talking about that uh, the gender disaggregated data is not available always so, <coughs> so the challenge that kerala had to build up the gender uh, disaggregated data otherwise the incidence of expenditure and the challenges are not earmarked we are not getting the macro indicators now <coughs> sorry as far as the take for india again since i'm talking about the take for india for the from the kerala model is concerned economic statistics is a challenged area generally data is a challenged area as we all know that uh, we are not comfortable with the kind of official statistics that exists in our country at all it doesn't give data for all indicators and it doesn't have a gender sensitivity gender awareness with respect to building and collection of the data so this is crucial to bring up um, gender responsive budgeting into the main dialogue i would have a comment on uh, in one of the slides when mridul was showing that gender related sectors and gender unrelated sectors these are very common i would not go into the full women uh, uh, women per, uh, plan and the others so women component plan now don't wcp and not but even in public expenditure in gender related sectors and gender unrelated sectors this division within the gender unrelated sector i found forests and this is something which has raised my query because if we look into india as a whole more, many women are fighting for their right to forest which has been given by the forest act so um this is one of my comments about but this division from the gender related sector and gender unrelated sectors is this coming out of um the budgetary expenditure exercise or is this is this division coming out of uh, the macro indicators 
from where this division is coming up. So I think um, this has to be move, uh, when we move beyond numbers, when we move beyond the funds, when we move towards indicators. So how do we make up this gender related and gender unrelated public expenditure? And it is definitely, and I'm very grateful to Mridul of uh, interpreting this and bringing up the political economic question here. There is a clear political economic question which is often missed out as far as the if we look into only the number game. The whole political economic questions of making some changes, of making changes in the whole society, making changes in the way in which women and men and the society look at their lives, like inclusion of transgender persons, increase in the work participation rate of women. So these are some of the changes which will, which are movers and shakers of these uh, gender discrimination process and patriarchy. So, so how can we move up into this uh, movers and shakers? I'm bringing up since the first um, who gave first recognition to the intra-household uh, food consumption disparity. So this was broken up. I give a single example. This was, this was moved and shaped by uh, the simple uh, 33rd uh, constitutional, the 73rd constitutional amendment where women were elected as panchayat leaders, women were elected as leaders, local leaders in the panchayat so that they had to go out uh, uh, and getting food for themselves earlier than the family is feeding. So uh, this is these are some of the ways. So you know, you attempt to do something, but it is ultimately a mover and shaker into the gender relations of the society. So the, the target of gender responsive uh, budgeting, I'm very grateful to for Medu of bringing it up, is a deeper political economic question of moving beyond numbers. But how is Kerala moving beyond numbers? Kerala has been able to, two, three examples are there. But um, how is Kerala moving beyond numbers? And if the country is not moving beyond the numbers, is the absence of GRB a reason for that? It is sufficient. But uh, others may, uh, they say, may say that this is uh, not necessary. You can include it in various schemes and you can do it. But inclusion of schemes only cannot be the way in which we look at the GRB. The indicators and indicators are to be macroeconomic indicators. So I think um, these are my broad comments and these are the ways in which I could visualize the Kerala model and whether can it be a model for the country when we have such diverse divergences in the institutional setup in the way in which the movers and shakers of these uh, political economy is concerned, that set up. So whether this model can be replicated in the country without including up the, without having any uh, way to shake off the prerequisites. So this is also the thing that is uh, my, uh, this is the headache of this gender responsive budgeting which all of us share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ishita. Thank you so much. Thank emphasizing you. the planning processes, very importance of plan, uh, planning processes, very important. And currently, India doesn't have, only Kerala has continued. Uh, and also mentioning transformative financing, need for gender disaggregated data, and also uh, the question of political economy. Uh, and also going beyond numbers, very important, and the challenge that we are facing in terms of declining work participation of women, very, very insightful response. Now, I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Sangamitra, Dr. Mini Sukumar, that as a member of Planning Board of Kerala, what are the challenges you are facing in post-COVID period with regards to GRB? Does Kerala state have a policy for women? Uh, what is the state policy for development intervention for the transgender communities? And what kind of gender disaggregate is collected recently? I think to some extent, Dr. Mridul Lepin has also taken care of that. And as a member of governing board of Gender Park, 
Department of Women and Child Development of Government of Kerala. Can you tell us about the role of Gender Park and how does it connect itself with the women elected representatives of Panchayati Raj institutions and Kutum Shri, which is also again a, one of the best practice considered to be one of the best practices uh, uh, at a sub-national level. Uh, Dr. Mini Sukumar. Yeah. Thank you, Vibhudi, for uh, these questions to focus my comments. Um, first of all, I, I think that uh, Murdul has uh, presented in detail about the process of gender budgeting uh, that we are practicing. And uh, when I was uh, taking up the charge of the member of uh, state planning board, my task was much easier because Murdul has already laid down the processes and uh, the approach of gender budgeting and it, it is uh, stabilized. Um, and uh, the gender budget has been approved and acknowledged by most of the line departments and the government and the public. So my task was much easier. But at the same time, uh, I can see that uh, the process of gender budgeting has influenced the perception of our departments regarding how to formulate programs and schemes for women. Uh, in the before really they are not, not at all um, uh, informed about the importance of the gender budget budgeting. And later, it was like adding women into the budget, some like the numbers. There are some uh, numbers to be included, like if there is a scheme, there should be 30% or 50% to be benefited to the women. But this time, what I can uh, see from the, uh, where, while reviewing the schemes, I can definitely see that there is some sort of changes in their perception regarding how to include to an extent the gender concerns of our society into their planning. So that is one major achievement of this gender budgeting for the last few years. So this year, um, there is some innovative approaches has been uh, seen in the new uh, schemes and in the new programs. and. Uh, like what Murdul said, they have uh, most of the departments has given the bifurcation for the detailing of the schemes, like the components. Like uh, before, there were you no know, much of the schemes are not given in components, only giving the uh, some aggregate type of uh, data. But this time, uh, uh, many of the departments are willing to uh, have these components, that gender components. So that is one um, achievement with respect to the planning process. And also, um, most of these officials and uh, the ministers, they are, um, while uh, interacting with them, they are all uh, uh, supporting the process of gender budgeting and bringing gender concerns into the, um, into this, uh, into the budgeting and also the implementation of the scheme. So that coordination between the government department, the state planning board and the finance department is much stronger and institutionalized. That is one major uh, major achievement. So this pragmatic ap approach has been given this um, strength to this uh, process. So I think now from this year onwards, uh, we are trying to make it more uh, in an analytical way of gender auditing. We are trying to make some sort of gender auditing for even for some selected schemes. And also, um, I think uh, we can also see that in the in the uh, while the reviewing the schemes and also it is you can witness it in the gender budgeting document that certain collaborations and convergence has been uh, made successful between the sectors or between the departments. Uh, some of the departments are coming forward thinking about more collaborations and more convergence approach. For example. Uh, in uh, in this trial, we are classifying the schemes into broadly into uh, four sectors. The major uh, sector was uh, like not, just not into one sector, but the major category of the schemes were were, were in the education, skilling, and employment. So these three things uh, has visible in many of the uh, schemes in different sectors and different departments. So this has even given uh, an importance in uh, this education, skilling, and employment. So I, I, I wish to connect this with your question about the women's policy, the gender policy of the state. The gender policy of the state is focusing on 
um, the employability, enhancing the employability and work participation of women. That is the main concept because we have a large number of unemployed women and a large number of educated unemployed women in our state. And this, uh, this, this potential is not being utilized for many years for various reasons. Some of the reasons are cultural, social, and economic, and also related to the developmental process of the state. So we have a very good number of women, educated women, and women having skills and other capabilities. So this, the, the, the general uh, policy of the state is mainly focusing on this, enhancing the uh, economic empowerment of women, also uh, with along with addressing the issue of violence against women, combating the violence against women, and also giving importance to health, especially mental health. These are the major um, mainstays of the policy. And in this sector of edu uh, coming together, education, skilling, and employment, we can see a larger number of schemes. Like uh, there are 136 schemes across different departments are focusing on these three things. And also uh, cooperation, the departments like cooperation, agriculture, animal husbandry, dairy development, these sectors have emerged as a major uh, creator of employment opportunities for women. So that is one uh, importance. I, I can see it as a result of the convergence or the, um, or the spread of the awareness across the departments for uh, new schemes. And for few years, state is witnessing the, uh, a growing feminization of uh, agriculture in Kerala because um, the agriculture, the participation of women in agriculture sector was declining for few years because of the uh, changes in farming practices and other things. And uh, that was a major reason for the declining work participation rate of women in Kerala, like the paddy uh, cultivation, which was a main field where women workers are uh, participating. And for the last few years, the Kudumbasri and uh, the agriculture department is um, promoting the joint liability groups for farming. And also the Kudumbasri groups are taking up fallow lands uh, and uh, uh, attempting their leased land cultivation. So that's a major thing. And during the pandemic, many of these Kudumbasri groups are engaging with this thing and they are utilizing the, some of the central schemes like the MKSP and also um, combining it with the um, Narega and there, are, there is a, a support from the agriculture department also giving them seeds and other things that uh, uh, fertilizers and all. So like that, that field is emerging, that feminization of this type of agricultural practices are emerging. So this year, this year's budget, we can see a clean, uh, a clear uh, acknowledgement of the departments of cooperation and agriculture. They are coming forward, forming the primary agriculture credit societies for supporting these women JLG groups. So this is one example I can uh, I can flag uh, as an important uh, important step towards this convergence of uh, and um, like what we have um, uh, following the uh, that priority given to the social security and health that is uh, continuing and Murdul has given many examples. So, uh, and um, emergence of uh, the, a, a growing emergence, uh, a growing importance of concerns regarding the working women, like giving more working, uh, set up more working women's hostels. And there is a, an innovative program called she stay. It is um, by the Women Development Corporation. It is like a room rendered to women who are traveling as part of their uh, jobs and uh, uh, other, um, uh, if they are traveling from their district to or from their homes to other places, they will get cheap accommodation, safer, cheaper accommodation in places called, uh, it's, these are like uh, some like the, like the OYO homes, it is run by the Women's Development Corporation. So they are very safe to for women. So it is called She Stay. They have they have a um, app application based program, so it can be accessed from everywhere. Any women can access this. This like this this importance of women's travel, women's um, 
initiatives for their own uh, economic activities their own initiatives for their uh, expressions are all being acknowledged across different departments like what brudul uh, mentioned about the cultural department for this uh, women's film making and training for women film makers and technicians like that so there is a growing acknowledgement for uh, the the real contribution of women their expressions their interests their aspirations that is one major impact of this uh, general budgeting and still uh, that we have in in the state we have an enabling atmosphere of political atmosphere which is supporting women's uh, concern and also their right to be independent and that is one major thing and the legacy of kerala development and the role of people's participation in the success of kudumbasri is mainly based on this people's participation at the local level so and also the importance of local uh, self government institution they are playing a major role in uh, in in fulfilling many of this Uh, pro uh, the schemes and also attaining these uh, targets so the role of uh, this panchayat raj institution local self governments and the participation of women in lsdis are very um, very important even though they are their general budgeting uh, programs are going in a different way but their presence and their support is a main um, i think it's a ma major factor and during this exercise i am feeling that uh, there are certain uh, challenges uh, also there are certain challenges one is mainly what mrudul mentioned like the non availability of gender segregated data that's a major uh, issue and also um, the second generational issues like uh, the the higher number of educated women how do we can find out um uh, suitable jobs for them and uh, also the the issues of violence against women and increasing dowry and the aspirations of the middle class for uh, more and more money and uh, related things uh, and all connected with marriage the centrality of marriage and um, the centrality of marriage is, is directly connected with the that domestic violence and dowry does uh, dowry etc etc and also the toxic uh, relationships and related crimes it's a newer area which we are just realize just acknowledging now that there are a lot of issues coming um of murdering young women because of this toxic relationships and um, also the cultural setup in which women are still treated like a, a second grade person so these are some of the issues which we still struggling with so they, these are all the, these issues all have a direct impact upon this planning and other things because uh, the, the people who are sitting there and doing things uh, are also sharing many of this uh, uh, prejudices and many of this cultural uh, issues so that is one major thing and the other one um, is uh, uh, the issue of the marginalized communities like dalit tribal coastal communities and the, their participation and many of this uh, developmental indicators are not yet been shared by these um, vulnerable groups and that's another major challenge maybe it is directly related to what issues are told about the uh, the rights of the women related to forests and how we are, we can define that those rights of women who are uh, from the forest communities and uh, lot of uh issues and lot of awareness also to be uh, created in terms of the issues related to this uh, vulnerable communities the kudumbasri is also not been very strong it is not uh, strong in these areas and because there are a lot of um, problems the operational problems are there also the social and other uh, issues of backwardness and uh, and the lack of resources mainly the lack of resources of these women for to be part of this uh, networks that also is a major issue yeah. so that i think that will be a major challenge yeah. can you just so highlight the role finance. of gender park yeah yeah sure and um, the role of women's movement is another thing and uh, whenever we are talking about the 
this gender budgeting thing the needs of the women should be realized and to be articulated by the movement that also to be strengthened now the most of these needs are identified by the uh, government mechanism or by the government uh, uh, schemes and government officials so the, the strengthening the women's movement to identify and articulate women's needs and that is one major task we have to uh, from the movement side i am talking about that we, we 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 have to look into that strengthening that relationship with the women's movement and the planning process that's another thing and uh, regarding the gender park gender park is not uh, directly connected with the training of the women uh representatives the, the women the trainings of uh, elected representatives are done by kerala institute of local administration and they are doing a fantastic work they are training uh, women from all the three tiers of the lsdis and they have a uh, online course on gender and development certificate course on gender and development um, and also recently they have started a course on local development and um, they uh, recently they have started the exercise of gender budgeting training for gender budgeting for the elected women representatives from selected gram panchayats and uh, also they are starting a, a center for this urban development also with uh, gender concerns so in gender park it is mainly uh, envisaged as a space for research skill building and uh, cultural and other sort of uh, gatherings of women to women to come together and have to express their uh, art and other things and there is a library uh, and a research center and uh, a, and and a campus which can be used as a place for all these purposes so gender park is mainly it is coming under the department of women and child development uh, it's a part of women and child development and it is in the process of uh, a process of stabilizing its activities and there is a gender museum uh, heritage museum is started and uh, it is uh, presenting uh, the capturing the history the journey of kerala women so it is already started that progress is uh, it is progressing that work is progressing and library is already open and uh, the mainly the college students and housewives and young researchers are visiting the library and they are organizing Uh, talks and other programs uh, online and offline that recently they have started offline programs also and uh, there is a, a fellowship program is coming for the women in uh, social entrepreneurship it is in the planning stage and the uh, gender park has organized two major international uh, conferences and the next one will be coming uh, after two years it's a biannual conference that is another major activity so uh, and the women and child department is trying to make it uh, more it is like a hub of training uh, programs for the functionaries of their the department as well as from other departments and they are also trying to make collaborations with the higher education institutions for uh, other programs that is what uh, gender park is doing so i think thank i have <laughs> i have thank you professor thank you right kumar, minister kumar <laughs> for uh, bringing out a very important uh, aspects of convergence between different departments and also how you are emphasizing education skilling and employment as a major concern recently you also told us the highlights of gender policy of the kerala state and uh, also the highlighted the concerns of uh, forest women and women from the marginalized section so i think the and challenges that you are facing so very realistic insightful uh, narrative that you gave it gave us a very grounded reality now i would like to ask dr sangamitra dar that you have worked with the un institutions and you have also worked with several uh, state governments no as representative of un women uh, at a sub national level you have done the grb exercise with uh, several union territories and state governments so how is your response to kerala's uh, performance of grb and which are the other state governments and union territories they are proactively and judiciously implementing grp what are the learnings for other states i think dr ishita also highlighted that uh, there are learnings from kerala model for rest of the states so according to you what are those learnings over to dr sangamitra thank you uh, am i audible yes okay 
Uh, before I say a few words, I would really want to take a moment to thank Impre team for organizing such an interesting discussion and also inviting me to uh, be part of this discussion. As always, listening to Professor Epen is always a pleasure and a motivation. So Kerala experience, as we know uh, it now, is indeed a fantastic example of good practice. And uh, very recently, uh, UN Women has already documented this as a case study that will facilitate the knowledge sharing and scale it to other subnational under our current GRG project that we are uh, uh, implementing in four states. And uh, as far as I remember, uh, Gender Park uh, of Kerala is also a collaboration that UN Women is, has supported. So uh, yeah, we are trying to help in every uh, gender related project that is uh, possible for us. And cognizant to the time, uh, uh, I'll just uh, very briefly talk about what we understand by GRB in, in, in the conversation. And uh, also, as you rightly pointed out, uh, Professor Vibhuti, uh, UN Women is working on uh, many subnational level also, but from the beginning in the entire GRB conversation, we have been actively engaged right from the implementation or the adoption of the GRB in the country to uh, building the ma ma manual. Of course, uh, we ha have the veterans like uh, Ashakpur Mehta and uh, Paramita Mazumdar, all of them uh, contributing to it heavily, but uh, UN Women was a uh, uh, was in the background supporting all of these conversations because we believe knowledge uh, management and knowledge sharing is very, very critical for this overall conversation. So yes, we have, uh, we see GRB's goal as to promote gender equality by influencing the overall uh, budget process. So in that sense, we see GRB uh, 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 has to incorporate the gender equality perspective. So the moment we see in that light, the gender uh, budgeting process becomes uh, a, a sub part of it. But the bigger picture is actually looking at the gender equality perspective. So because we uh, very uh, uh, broad, uh, very majorly work on the uh, ending violence against women uh, uh, campaign in the country and globally also. So that is there. Then uh, along with it, we also uh, like uh, in all our conversations, in all our uh, uh, advocacy on awareness, we try to um, put this conversation in 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 record that gender budgeting uh, process is not a separate budget discussion for women. It is a discussion where we are see, uh, we are we are basically trying to simply increase the specific budgets allocation directly to these groups, be it the women, be it the transgender, be it uh, any other uh, marginalized group. So that is also one of our goals and uh, our, our approach to the discussion. Then we also see that uh, it involves, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Epen or uh, Ishita, uh, uh, Professor Ishita and uh, Mini Sukumar, all of them have rightly pointed out that collecting revenue and allocating expenditure that addresses persistent inequalities between women and uh, girls along with men and boys. If we do not see it in that bigger light, then we are actually missing out on the overall conversation, the inclusive conversation that we have. So at you, in you and women, we see it in that light. And that's why when we engage in this conversation, we strongly believe in engaging, building a strategic partnership and capacity building is one of the major uh, aspects that we look into awareness generation policy advocacy and outreach uh, everyone has pointed out the lack of diseg uh, sex disaggregated data we are majorly working under this this project also and earlier also we have been majorly working on building the capacities of the state governments in in recognizing this and building a format. So uh, like currently, if I give one example from my own personal experience of uh, handholding the state uh, or a remote state in India, in Northeastern India called Manipur, the finance, because here the convergence is between uh, finance and uh, social welfare. So we have been uh, instrumental in incorporating a format that has been uh, like institutionalized along with the gender circu uh, budget circular where they have to every department has to uh, enumerate the numbers 
be it the beneficiary oriented or the non beneficiary oriented so we are expecting over a period of time we will have that information where we just don't go on repeating that there is a lack of data there is a lack of data we are trying to address it by uh, incorporating or or rather institutionalizing this thing along with uh, the other aspect where we see the e governance aspect where it is missing and 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 lot of uh, lot of uh, uh, discussions are around it so we are also trying to build that conversation we are also uh, in in the advocacy we have various union ministries agriculture rural development panchayati raj uh, mwcd finance all of them in the conversation and the union level as well as in the state levels because we strongly believe and 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 it's rightly been uh, documented also that until and unless there is a convergence of all these departments a uh, uh, holistic realistic uh, and 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 uh, i'll pick the word from uh, mrzul ma'am's presentation the pragmatic uh, uh, plan cannot be made because practically these officers need to understand how it has to be done and it can be done only when we simplify those steps so you un women at our front are trying Uh, aggressively to build on those things capacity building is a major major element where we see that uh, uh, along with an increased uh, awareness we also have to see the accountability what is the accountability aspect on 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 that uh, dimension also and how the increase in budget allocation sometimes we as uh, uh, one of the speakers very rightly pointed out the feminists might actually challenge us on this but rightly uh, pointed out and i i acknowledge and uh, corroborate to it that even a 1% increase is for me a victory because when we see zero and we see one that itself a, 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 a quantitative person will automatically understand there is a progress so be it a slow progress but at least a progress so that way we try to acknowledge it changes in the distribution of benefits among beneficiaries that is like uh, we always talk about maternity leave we are also at un women we also try to talk about paternity leave why not uh, even on that conversation so we try to build on that we are uh, we have also tried to introduce and uh, increase uh, 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 new policies be it the mudra or, or uh, safe cities uh, project and all so uh, overall uh, un women has been trying to build a technical support which uh, institutionalizes uh, accountability framework nationally as well as subnationally and uh, there are too many states that we are engaged with so enumerating that will be a long list so but uh, yeah broadly all the major players in the country who are working on grb we are very grateful that we have been part of that uh, conversation in all the in all the regions of the all the country and also one small thing that uh, that is an internal uh, thing that un women's methodology on women's safety audit was even acknowledged by the government of india at the 71st uh, session on uh, un uh, general assembly so we have been trying to make these uh, overall changes and rather a mindset change because uh, someone rightly pointed out the mindset has to change not only of uh, us who are working on it but the other person on the other side of the table because if they don't realize that yes there is a need for a change no matter how much we discuss on this how much we try to build the capacity end of the day they will still say that okay women are the second uh, citizens and why are we so bothered about it at a later period so we don't want that to happen and that's why we are making uh, kind of uh, 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 overall behavior uh, dimension where we are trying to change all these uh, uh, mindsets through systemic small small steps it may it may seem very small but these are very critical because if they, those changes are not made until and unless uh, 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 those changes are made we cannot actually mainstream the overall conversation and um, uh, uh, vibhuti ji uh, in your post one of the person had pointed out grb cannot be just uh, one tool i accept that uh, to that uh, the audience i just want to say that this is just one tool that we are talking about and thank you for uh, pointing it out this is one tool that is 
looking at the policy level, there are numerous other tools that are working in tandem with this. And uh, thank you, thank you for, uh, I hope I have answered your query. Yeah, thank you. So I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sangamitra Dar. And I think what all you have told, I think I would like to add that you have also gone beyond gender binary and you have also highlighted intersectional marginality. So GRB tool, how can it be used for uh, empowerment of scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, uh, person with disabilities, elderly people, and uh, for transgender communities. So I think that I found, and I find all those things are in public domain, so easy to download and share with the students and researchers. So I think that is a very important role that you and women has played. And I think now you have started giving material also in Indian languages, no? Some of the Hindi. Yes, yes. Are we are working aggressively on that. Also. They are also downloadable. Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Now, the last question is uh, to Dr. Suchit uh, Krishna Prasad. You work with the uh, workers' organization, trade union movement, and uh, you have also teaching. Uh, you are teaching uh, economics. How would you see Kerala's uh, experience uh, being useful to other states and also for Maharashtra? What are the learnings of Kerala? Experiment. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh... Professor Vibhuti Patel and uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar for having me here. It has been an enriching experience to listen to people who have actually gone from ground into maybe the budget room and, uh, you know, actually made it happen. So uh, I think uh, there are many, uh, the, the entire journey of going from number to schemes or breaking up all the schemes and uh, showing the journey from the basics to the self-actualization. You know, I would almost put it as, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The first being very basic and final being self-actualization. So the kind of schemes that uh, Kerala government has been able to put into their gender responsive budgeting in terms of uh, making women technically more efficient uh, the working women's hostels and so on, and especially the you know the end result of all that being the labor force participation rising, you know. And I think between the Part A and Part B data that uh, Professor Mudurul showed, I was particularly fascinated by uh, the urban rural urban employment schemes. You know, there are many uh, experts on employment like Santosh Mehrotra and. Uh, Amit Basule, who have been talking for a long time about bringing in the Manrega into the urban areas uh, and hats off to the Kerala government for actually implementing it and uh, finding out how many women are going to be. Also providing hostels for the workers. Also providing hostels. So uh, so making everything and then the midday meal and uh, you know the support that has been given during the pandemic. Uh, and now that the, you know, I think the entire process has been very dynamic, basically, uh, from uh, uh, from helping students who have come from Ukraine, uh, of course, without any disaggregated data and so on. But all the all of that, uh, I think each one, each of those points can actually be the best best practice. Uh, if you ask about Maharashtra, I think. Um, again, going back to the hierarchy of needs, you know, maybe at the first level, you have to ensure that the female infanticide goes down. So the first thing is survival, of course. Uh, we all know that in Maharashtra, which is supposed to be a progressive state, the child marriages have increased during the pandemic. So how do we support uh, them, you know, children or families who think that uh, getting the a girl married off at an early age is the only resort. What is the support that the state can give? All right, and uh, uh, and there is a dropout rate which has increased. Okay, and again the women dropout rate has increased. Data also shows that women going back to work after the pandemic, the number has fallen down. So all our, these are all the areas where uh, I think. In Maharashtra, we may have to work because Maharashtra has been traditionally a, a very progressive state, a state with uh, Pule and people like uh, you know who yeah, have spoken about. Children also have increased. 
Pardon? Out of school children, especially. Out of school children has increased and uh, girls' education has got secondary importance. So, of course, the central government is coming up with uh, various uh, programs for developing digital platforms and so on. Uh, keeping the suspicion aside, uh, can probably, let's say, in the local uh, self-governments or local governing bodies, can uh, digital platforms be made available for, of course, the televisions are now uh, keeping uh, classes for, you know, at various uh, uh, standards. So, um, so these would be, I mean, I think each one of those can be a best practice, which can be actually written down and uh, found out whether that can be taken up. I actually had one little uh, question um, also for uh, uh, Professor Murugul. You know, um, Debbie Bundler, Bundler and um, uh, Gay Havitt's book on um, practical journal, um, practi practitioner's guide to understanding the gender uh, response budgeting shows that there are variations, of course. Of course, when we take from one uh, state to another state, they say that there would be differences based on socio-political context and whether the initiatives were coordinated by mainly the bureaucrats and the government legislators or the civil society organizations and capacity of the institutions themselves. It looks like Kerala has very strong institutions, but uh, most of this effort has been from the planning board, which again, uh, as uh, Professor Ishita pointed out, at a national level, if the planning commission uh, has exited, so are we going to have a vacuum at that level? Okay, so um, in fact, even at the state level, unless and until there's a coordinating machinery, it would be hard to find out. First of all, we are talking about the gender desegregated data not being available. If there is no uh, coordinating authority, it would be uh, impossible. So uh, one can learn this also from Kerala, having a strong coordinating uh, body. Um, and um, of course, uh, I think eventually every state right now, barring some nine states, all other states in India have introduced uh, gender responsive, responsive budgeting, some nine states, barring uh, nine states. But I think uh, increasingly there will be a pressure because uh, women as voters have emerged as a very powerful lobby. And I think uh, whether it's a national election or a local level election, many have found out that this is a hidden voter who's probably not there in the rallies, probably not talking much. And uh, the recent findings show that women are not going by the caste or the rest of the typical uh, biases that are introduced or the head of the family can no longer dictate women where uh, to vote. So I think this therefore is going to be a powerful lobby that uh, politicians would also like to woo uh, sooner or later. So uh, uh, of course, then there are, uh, you know, uh, Nirmala Banerjee speaks of uh, different levels once again uh, of how to um, approach uh, in the gender responsive budgeting. Uh, in which she uh, mentions that, of course, we'll have to support the activities which are traditionally uh, genderized, okay? So uh, maybe cooking gas or drinking water or better, uh, you know, sanitation and so on. So these would be, and the safety and so on. So these are, uh, of course, uh, critics, you know, looked at as uh, patriarchal, uh, patriarchal uh, uh, you know, perceptions. But they are and like then, but, needs, no? like yeah, and, and needs. yes. But uh, as we say, uh, going from that level, Kerala has moved on to a self-actualization mode. And uh, uh, it's heartening to see that uh, labor force participation has increased beyond the national average um, in, in Kerala as a result of all this, perhaps. And uh, two women have actually gone and uh, bagged award at International Film Festival, which is, you know, in the coming days, the media and the film is going to be a very important uh, component, uh, make creating opinions. Opinion makers are going to be uh, these people and therefore that. Uh, but coming to, you know, evaluation of a budget, uh, coming to evaluation of a budget, I feel uh, there are many which are, you know, some of the effects are lagged. You can't immediately, so even though we say macroeconomic indicators and so on, but when you're empowering a class of society to see their results coming out and making an impact on the society might take a little longer. 
especially in case of women. So uh, data says that uh, after the Grameen Bank revolution, for example, in Bangladesh, uh, it took about 15 years for average number of children in the family to drop from six to three. Uh, and, uh, you know, so so this kind of, uh, uh, it's it's a long process. And as uh, uh, Minnie Madam uh, mentioned, that new challenges are coming up, like toxic relations and so on. But it's heartening to see that uh, the authorities are aware of these things. And when you're aware and not hiding, aware and not making another political polemics, creating another political polemics and confusing people, when you're addressing it, there is a high chance uh, that it would be addressed uh, in a couple of years to come. So I think each one of those uh, stories uh, can become a best practice. And I think Maharashtra can learn a good deal from Kerala. In fact, when I uh, did a program for um, ILO on uh, uh, role of uh, labor administration in um, uh, social dialogue, I found that in Kerala, we had uh, uh, online industrial relations chat rooms, chat rooms where you could simply come. And so the digital platform uh, for uh, people to simply come and air their grievances, that's a, a phenomenal uh, uh, step that was taken up. So yes, I think we can learn uh, all these things about not just thinking about numbers, but coming to schemes. And there again, uh, probably not just being bureaucratic, but engaging the civil society organizations or NGOs. We have effective NGOs in uh, Maharashtra. We have Pratham for uh, engaged in education and so many. So engaging with them and then so that it can go from top to bottom and again, bottom to top. And, uh, you know, going from one level, making sure that there are no starvation deaths Sadly, last budget, uh, this budget cut down the allocation on uh, Anganwadi and Asha, um, thinking that the worst is over and probably we don't have to support. So uh, the minute that happens, the the nutrition level goes down and, you know, and, and it starts showing um, declining results. So uh, right from there to uh, protecting children, uh, women, girls who are pushed into marriages, to protecting women who have had to uh, had unwanted uh, pregnancies di in, during the pandemic. So there are a number of issues and trafficking I think also. there's trafficking. much to learn. Trafficking of girls. Trafficking, trafficking and so on. So there's much to learn, as we said, dropouts in the schools. So yeah, yeah. thank you uh, for, for allowing me to um, share this and uh, learn from so many uh, valuable Thank you, Dr. Suchita, for giving such a balanced comparative analysis and also highlighting the participatory processes, which are that, that's very important uh, so far as the Kerala's experience is concerned. Uh, now, there is a question from, uh, from Rajini Menon from Oxfam. Dear ma'am, thank you so much for this enriching presentation. Did you have any specific approach to vis visibilize needs of adolescent girls? So, yeah, Dr. Mridul. There, you know, I just I just talked about a very few schemes. If you look up the general budget, you will find there was earlier a central government scheme on adolescent uh, adolescent girls. Even now there is, but uh, they are very much there in in uh, in some of the schemes that we have. Definitely, uh, you know, the adolescent girls, especially uh, not only just through anganwadis, and uh, they are supposed to be looking after you know, the the adolescent girl clubs and all that. But even otherwise, the government has schemes for adolescent girls, especially, and for boys also. I mean, that's what we're real, real, realizing now, that so many things we have to do, boys and girls, you know, whether it's sensitization, whether it's for boys to learn right from the uh, early age, cooking and household work together with girls. So many things are now, you know, actually figuring in, uh, in the minds of uh, the policymakers, because as I said, for creating a gender conscious society, we have to keep on thinking of new and new things. You know? Because something doesn't work, what do we do? So, you know, if there, there was a wonderful program which came just before pandemic, night walks in Kerala. You know, there was this, what many said about the toxic relationship, the jilted lovers, there was a two or three, you know, very uh, sort of consecutive uh, killings of girls, either through burning or through 
you know, because the, the lovers were jilted, they didn't, you know, they didn't take no for an answer. So the girl was just shot. So even the women were so agitated, you know, when the, and the minister had a huge meeting of all the concerned people, you know, NGOs and government officials and all the other teachers, etc. And in that, one of the schemes which emerged was, let's have night walks. Let's establish our right over, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, the city. Because it happened first in Trivandrum and then it later went to the districts also, but it had to stop because of the pandemic. So I think, you know, and now of course there's pink police. We have a pink police. They still are carrying on with the old uh, pink and blue, you know, pink for women and blue for men, I guess. But so that there's a pink police as part of the police force and they are, you know, uh, sort of collaborating or helping out communities like the residents associations, you know, to keep a sort of watch on what's happening. So new, new things in, 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 uh, in creating awareness. I think that's the thing I want to emphasize that we can't sit with one scheme and think that's going to solve the problem. No, you have to keep, and you know, see what Mini was talking about the legacy of, of uh, public action, you know, this whole legacy of where people mobilize and we think of our concern first is how to help the people. I don't know how it happens, but the, and this question was asked, I, I don't want to go on to the other thing. Now I wanted to re respond to Ishita and Sanghamitra and Suchita, but let's see if there are any more questions then. Yeah, there, is, there are questions, two questions for you. One is uh, from Neelam Rana. Thanks uh, for a very insightful and in, uh, interesting session. I have few questions to Professor But in the current form of GRB reporting, i.e. part A and part B, <clears throat> where would the Harit Karma uh, Sena scheme fit and why? And second question is that the reasons why certain sectors are considered quote-unquote gender-related uh, and quote-unquote gender-unrelated sectors and what are the implications of such division for GRB and women? You know, first I talk to the uh, gender-related and unrelated, which I think Ishita also raised. You see, this was a term used in those checklists. It, it, it's a very simple term. It doesn't mean anything very deep. You know. All it meant was that these are sectors where you can see women a little more than, and you can probably disaggregate them rather than certain sectors like transport, as I said. How do you know how many women are traveling by bus? How many men are traveling by bus? Impossible. So that is what they called. So it was a very simple term, but it, it didn't mean anything more than that. You know. So it is only that you cannot have a gender marker is it zero gender sensitivity? Is it a, to some extent gender sensitive? You can have markers like that, like the UN has, has done. So it doesn't mean more than that. So this is what I want to say first about. And the first question was, sorry? About the- Ah, the Akharta Karma Sena. Uh, if, you know, in all probabilities, it's all women Sena. In Kerala, the Harita Karma Sena, if I remember right, was a totally a woman thing. But even if it is not, Supposing it is uh, men and women, th there are these all these, all these are documented with the panchayats. They are, they, it's all there, so you can know how many women and how many men. But my recollection is that the Haritha, there were two things which happened earlier. There was a uh, what is called the labor bank, which was men and women. Then the Haritha Karma Sena, which was for the uh, for the uh, sanitation program. That I remember that in the it was panchayats, and I think it's mostly women. So that was the, I think, my answer to that. It's primarily women. Maybe Mini might know a little more on that. Mini, would you like to answer about Harita Karma Sena? Huh? Yeah, Harita uh, Karma Sena, uh, basically, it is started like uh, by the Kudumbasri uh, for women working, as uh, volunteers working with the agriculture field. And also uh, with this um, what is called waste management in gram panchayats and all. And now they are more organized. Uh, the LSGIs are uh, selected, selecting women groups for doing this work of uh, waste management. Basically, it's uh, composting. Composting. Not composting. They are collecting like the uh, and segregating. Because they are the uh, waste from houses and not the bio, uh, this the non-degradable waste like plastics. Uh, 
the bottles other things and they collect it and uh, the uh, at panchayat level or the gram panchayat level they collect at lsda level they collect it to the together and hand it over to the uh, another agency so they will get money both from the houses and also from the lsdis yeah it is like a partly an income generation scheme and also uh, connected with the the entire uh, biodegradable uh, non degradable waste collection so it's primarily women it's primarily yeah, women. primarily women primarily yeah so it is part a yeah so the second question it would be yeah the second set of questions by neelam rana are addressed to i think mostly professor ishita i uh, add one more thing uh, regarding yeah. the adolescent program yeah <clears throat> there was one question about the adolescent yes yeah. program that uh, we have uh, adolescent clubs uh, or adolescent programs in kudumbasri and also there are uh, programs in the health uh, department and also uh, the new scheme introduced for the by the sports uh, and youth welfare that uh, women specific zones for uh, in the sports complexes there also the adolescent girls are uh, one of the beneficiaries and more uh, other programs like uh, the um, life skill education and uh, some sort of programs are also there by as part of the school education program directly uh, related to the adolescent uh, both boys and girls and uh, in kerala most of the adolescent the age group are in schools in so more, many of these programs are uh, implemented through schools and the dropout rate is very uh, minimal and uh, most of the uh, girls are mainstreamed into school education so that is uh, one thing and also i, I forgot to mention one interesting program we started this year um, like uh, as per an example of the um, convergence between the kerala uh, housing board and women and child department that is called tande idam that means uh, her own space own space that is for the women the girls who are completed 18 years at the uh, nirbhaya homes and in the uh, orphanages like that girls homes they have to move out after attaining the 18 years of age because they can they will not get uh, support uh, they will not stay back in the homes after 18 years so um, many of these women have no place to go so this year the, uh, this women and child department came forward with a scheme called this heron space tandeeda giving support for um, for building their own houses so we modified it in collaboration with the kerala state housing board because they have uh, readily available housing units as apartments apartment complexes for the lower income groups it is uh, around 20 lakhs like priced um, smaller smaller units so we combine these two programs together and this year we are implementing it because they will get Uh, cross subsidies from uh, women and child and also from they, they will get the money from women and child and get a subsidy from the housing board so they can manage to get a two bedroom smaller flat units uh, for these girls so uh, the women who are already the girls who are already having a skill training or having some sort of um, jobs they have already attained they can move out to this uh, housing unit and it will be in their need it is like their permanent house they get on that house so we start this uh, program this scheme as a pilot program this year hoping to have 10 housing units for this year and maybe for a uh, next year we can uh, increase it so that's another uh, another attempt for a con- collaborative approach uh, attempt for a collaborative functioning of two departments that i forgot right. to mention during my presentation thank you very much for such an inspiring in uh, news that you give it but uh, now the next set of questions are i think addressed to professor ishita and uh, neelam rana asks that uh, besides lack of disaggregated data what are the other major research gaps in grb for example panelists pointed out the need to go beyond numbers and uh, understand political economy aspect what kind of interdisciplinary studies are needed uh, so would you like to enlighten us Okay. actually yeah mridul also spoke that we need to move beyond numbers 
and this is the difference between studying an accounts part of the budget and studying the implications of this budget then the responsive budgeting is is basically that that you move beyond numbers to look into the gender implications in the society and you need interdisciplinary study of women's studies development studies political economy studies you need these to understand the relations between human beings and the relations the production relations and how these are affected how the sexual division of labor is getting affected basically due to these uh, uh, gender responsive budgeting it's not only gender mainstreaming that, that is it doesn't end only inclusion it's not that it is not that the whole indian data is telling us that even if you include women in a large number of schemes it initially started with the empowerment policy in 2001 then we declared a gender budgeting in <coughs> sorry in 2005 but why we are not successful why we are not successful in changing the gender relations in the country that we didn't go beyond numbers we mean the state didn't go beyond the numbers they didn't go beyond only the level the numbers that is the inclusion how many did you include did you change their lives did you have a policy which would be changing the uh, the relations in the society so we, we, does it change the sexual division of labor so the target and the ambition of these schemes are much greater the perspective so the research the agenda if you can tell us. research what? agenda is of course of um, hitting down the sexual division of labor i think why is it happening that the work that is the work the the, the severe fall in the employment in, in in india which kerala is combating in fact it's a challenge to kerala as well and it was it they combated it through gender responsive budgeting but why couldn't we educate the girls but even we educate why are our education numbers totally inconsistent with the workforce participation that is you have girls in education but we have lesser women why we have the missing number where why are we having this educated pool of unemployed women that is reaching beyond the numbers So we have to reach beyond the numbers, and this is the gender gap in the research. That is, we have to understand the implications and the indicators. What are the markers? What are the indicators? The markers cannot be total utilization and only inclusion in terms of number. That is why, in fact, some some of us mentioned it came up that this gender responsive budgeting is going to see the effect with a time lag. It has a lagged effect. now this lag effect has to be recognized how can we minimize the lag effect so we have to understand it has a lag effect now this time lag it has a gestation period of changing it's a it's a long term value it adds a long term value to the macro perspective of the economy so we have to recognize it as a having a lag effect in the macro perspective in the economy But in the meantime, new research gaps may come in, new things may emerge, but that has to be accommodated in the next year. So it's a dynamic process as such. Right. It is not a static thing which can be replicated. When yeah. I'm asking for takes from Kerala model for the country, I don't make the copy and paste it. It's not like that. It's not like that. It's a lag effect, and it has got macro dynamic implications. so we have to look at it in that light so these are the why would you need interdisciplinary research these are the things thank you thank you dr ashita and for, thank you for inviting I, me and yeah, this uh, has I, been a very vibrant discussion with so uh, uh, ms zubia uh, moin also has a question zubia please unmute yourself uh yes ma'am um thank you it was a really interactive session and i want to address the question to all the panelists present here so i say that um, all the ma'am touched upon wage laborer and livelihood and self employed so as we know that kerala is also largely urban and service sector is also there so 
what is the scenario of the unemployed women in other arenas and for middle class women and are there any unemployment exchange or alliance allowance which also cover poor as well as non poor and aspirations of young keralites and upward mobility opportunities as kerala is also linked to the world and international migration yeah who would like to answer i have talked a lot but i think a middle very class, interesting question class. here what about the middle class women <laughs> middle class women you see i i think sometimes what is happening is there are things happening at home there is a lot of them involved in some activity probably which is not recorded you know the lots of activities happening at home which are not recorded we know that the under the workforce participation rate if you if you look at home based work if you really took that into account it would be but the point is that what type of home based work is it subcontracting little you know making parts of little things so it doesn't really mean that women are employed in a decent activity and decent of ilo term terminology so the middle class women uh, the educated women you know now the thing is of course there are reasons why they may not be going out to work there could be you know social reasons or you know the family doesn't allow them to work after they get married there is a, there's a issue like that also that you know if you're a little better off then you know the your if if it's a work which is of your you know status you you are be allowed to go otherwise you may not be allowed to go so that is a big problem in kerala also that some of the women are not coming out to work because it doesn't either match their educational qualifications or it is not considered to be a status in terms of the the social uh, the class they belong to so this this is the sort of thing which is being trying to to uh, address very much because you know the, if you read the last budget not the general budget but even just the budget of kerala a lot of emphasis has been placed on how to get the educated i think 5 lakh or some number was given as educated unemployed women and how do we actually bring them into the employment field so now they are supposed to register kudubashree is actually a submission under the knowledge economy mission where you can register you what qualification do you have you know so i am saying that one thing as somebody pointed out that the government is very much aware of what is happening it's not that the government is not aware the government is also trying to take action but the point is sometimes it's it's not reaching to the extent it should and sometimes it is not really uh, having the effect that it should but that the government is aware of all that is happening there is absolutely no doubt so this question that you asked you know the especially the middle class that is what we are trying to do now how to get them i think there were actually two or three in the in the budget if i remember how to uh, you know uh, to uh, address the issues of the less educated how to address the issues of the somewhat more educated and the very educated you know the it walas like that so they actually broken it down into you know the, because we know that education may not reach all then are they going to be left out of the whole uh, thing that is happening in kerala so all the how do the kudubushri women for instance raise their levels of living you know they are not so educated but the younger ones are so there are now what do they call they they call that a group now the younger women are being formed into self help groups the, and mostly kudumbashree daughters you know that sort of a thing they 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 got a name to that i'm forgetting the name ajivika or something like that it's called ajivika. and uh -huh. they are they are forming groups now of so these are the women who are going to try and access the new things that are happening in kerala okay so that's how i respond yeah thanks a lot thank you all the panelists for very very interesting discussion uh, vibhuti i just uh, want to say one thing yeah, vibhuti yeah, i yeah. want to say one please, thing please please yeah uh, one thing I, i wanted to say to uh, ishita that you know this whole institutional thing and i think it's not uh, it's, it's not because you don't have a planning machinery that you have to make a mechanism it, it could be the department the finance and women and child these three are very crucial for discussion on on gender schemes in uh, each sector so when a, uh, in a state the one department is planning something there should be a mechanism the finance must be there they must be giving the money so but there should be a cell in which i don't believe in the gender budgeting cells you know they don't seem to have performed well but an agency which is uh, finance planning uh, even in, in without planning finance the department and the women and child something of that sort has to work ishita in, in the rest of the country women and child is the most powerless you know <laughs> <laughs> the most 
Yeah. I would absolutely like agree that. with you. I was trying to talk about uh, the institutions. There must be a back. Yeah, there has to be. Institutions. There has to be. And you have brought in very um, importantly this area of planning, which acted as an institution yeah. in Kerala. So in India, without this, this institution there must have been there must we must build up another kind of exactly, institutional exactly, support exactly. Has institutional support has to be very much essential that's can what i, I try yeah. to do. can i yeah. come in here no yeah. uh Sanjay, i want to say one thing then you come okay. in <laughs> i wanted to say how much actually i i didn't go into the history of gender budgeting in kerala but initially you know with the uh, the formation of the feminist economics groups by the in the 11th plan by uh, uh, saida hamid hmm. You know, the UN women came in a big way at that time. And they were holding all the meetings and workshops on gender budgeting. That's how we all got noticed. You know, the work we were done here got noticed. I think I remember Yamini coming here and looking at all the schemes which were there in the 11th five-year plan. And then we used to have workshops and Asha and Paramita and all these people, Bhumika, Yamini, all of them were, you know. So UN women has done a lot really in terms of, I didn't say it, but when you said it, I, I realized it's all started with, with the interest and the the finance and the support we got from the UN. Okay, I wanted to say that to you. Now you can say what you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Mrs. Woman Mrs. in the apex body planning. Yes, profession. yeah. Yes, one sir. one uh, yeah. addition to what Ishita ji has just said that uh, in the states, Ishita ji, the states that uh, we are working in, planning is there. Though the role has changed. What we are trying to do is, along with the nodal department, we are converging planning into the conversation because planning still now has the role of building the state vision plan. That's a different plan that they make for, for the overall state. So what in my case, I will say from my present experience in Manipur, although a very small state, but a very vibrant state and very proactive state, what we are doing is we have converged that thing the, these these departments and we are using idmc beyond what has been assigned in the manual so we are building the capacity of the idmc to see in this convergence portion so that it becomes a sustained model where whether un women remains or not they will function independently and they will sustain it and they'll take it forward like in case of uh, as mrdul ma'am is saying over there now they are they are thinking beyond the basic primaries so they have gone beyond as as krishna ji also pointed out if i look at the uh, maslow's model self actualization is a way 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 ahead we we cannot think on those but at least the first primary pyramids if we are able to attain then at a maybe another century it might take i don't know but at least our our progression is towards that so i just wanted to put it in uh, record in this conversation that processes are being made though some function though some uh, roles might have changed but we are trying to make do uh, with the with the uh, with the resources that are there in a in an innovative way so that it can be remain as a mainstream and a sustained model so with that i would just want to i just wanted to make this submission that yes planning is uh, not in a very primary role but planning is part of the conversation in most of the states we do try to uh, rope in planning br um, majorly because their role is very very primary so, the yeah. department remains the department of women and child Yes, nodal, nodal is women and child, but planning is one of the focals, definitely. Uh, yeah, Shikina, uh, can, just one, two sentences, actually. I think whatever happens, the pressure on the government to move towards gender responsive budgeting is inevitable for at least two things. One, which I mentioned, that women voters are now political constituents. Yeah, politically conscious. And the second thing is, whatever 5 trillion or whatever economy we want to build. Okay, the McKinsey report says that if the uh, labor force participation of women matches with men in India, we will add 26% to the GDP. Even the World Economic Forum. Also. So, yes. So if you, are, if you are thinking from the macro perspective of becoming rich and prosperous, then true. also uh, gender responsive budgeting necessary and at a micro level a woman whose cooking gas has become cheaper will decide which government comes into power yeah. so 
So thank you, Professor Mrithu Lippan, an expert discussions, Professor Ishita Mukhopadhyay, Dr. Mini Sukumaran, Dr. Sangamitra Da, Dr. Suchita Krishna Prasad for a valuable uh, insights on GRB. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated pre-existing economic inequalities and intersectional marginalization. And rigorous and concentrated GRB efforts are needed more than ever to facilitate gender-sensitive economic recovery in the face of current crisis. It is in this context that we need to learn from example of Kerala regarding implementation of gender-responsive budgeting. Uh, it's concerned with gender-sensitive formulation of legislation, programs, schemes, allocation of resources, implementation and execution, audit and impact assessment of programs and schemes and gender disaggregated data and follow up corrective actions to address gender disparities. We all accept that gender responsive budgeting is a powerful tool for achieving gender mainstreaming so as to ensure the benefits of development reach all genders. Here we are going beyond gender binary and Kerala has also done marvelous job by providing census of transgender persons so that development interventions can be made. Today's discussion has shown that elimination of gender inequality uh, for that gender responsive budgeting has both intrinsic and instrumental relevance. Persistent gender inequality hinders overall growth and development of a nation, uh, as I think in the last uh, statement made by Dr. Suchita. The economic rationale for promoting gender sensitive budget also emanates from efficiency and equity perspective that 50% of the population of citizens, their energies are not channelized and development investment is not made, then it is the state or the national nation which is the loser. Gender responsive budgeting exercise highlights how gender hierarchies influence budgets, gender based unpaid or low paid work. Kerala gender budgeting efforts stand out globally. I would not say only nationally, but I would say it is globally because of its human development index GDI and GM. Uh, are also quite praiseworthy. The achievement could happen due to knowledge building, networking, institutionalizing processes, and capacity building and enhancing accountability. When union budget allocation has stagnated, and this year it has even deteriorated with only 1% for the social sector, 99% has gone to CapEx. Kerala's record is really inspiring. Uh, I would uh, like every team to take over now. Thank you, ma'am. So over to Zubia. Yeah, thank you, everyone. It was indeed a very stimulating discussion with all the enlightened experts. And it was in uh, within a very limited time. And we would have loved to learn more from all of you. So as we come to the end of this extremely enlightening dis discussion, I, Zubia Moi, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi would like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center. Uh, we are great, grateful to Professor Vibhuti Patel for chairing and leading the special talk on a pragmatic approach towards gender responsive budgeting experience of Kerala. We'd also like to express our gratitude to the speaker for today's session. Professor Mridul Ethan for taking out her precious time to share her views on this crucial topic. We thank our esteemed discussants, Professor Mini Sukumar, Professor Suchita Krishna Prasad, Dr. Sangmitra Dhar, Professor Ishta Mukhopadhyay for adding your diverse perspectives and valuable insights to the deliberation. And of course, we thank all our participants here on Zoom or on Facebook Live for participating and raising pertinent questions. We are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on various podcasts. I hope that you continue to tune in future to our Gender Gap series and Embry hashtag the policy talk. Thank you once again, and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you, Thank you so much, Embry, Deputy, and Dr. Arjun, and Zubia, and to the other panelists. Thank you so much. Okay, I really learned a lot. Actually, I learned a lot.